Hey guys, hope you enjoyed that new intro. It was made by a fan of mine, his name I think is on screen right now, and I have to thank them so much for making it for me and allowing me to use it. Before we start, I just want to say if anyone wants to make any fan art or fan intros for me to use, feel free to send them in, and I'll be happy to use and check them out whenever you have. I'm truly grateful to have such awesome fans. My only suggestion is that you don't use copyrighted music or anything like that that will get my videos demonetized. You can send fan-made stuff in the comments on YouTube, through Twitter, or DeviantArt, just whatever way you can. I sadly do not have a Facebook or Instagram or anything like that, so sorry. Just to tell you guys, I would really, really love a nice fan-made intro that was really well animated and stuff. Because, let's just say my animation is, eh? It's okay. You know, I try my best. Alright, well anyways, again, sorry for the hiatus, life has really been getting in the way lately, and I've really hit a writer's block as well. Regardless, I'm back. I know I said I was making another paleo profile, and I was, but I got quickly distracted. I don't know, I've been just putting off this video for quite some time, and I think it's time to just pull off the band-aid. Today I'm doing something untraditional, and something I hopefully won't have to do again. Over the past two to almost three years I've been making paleontology and science videos, I've covered an absurd amount of topics from the proto-mammals of the Permian to the fluffy tyrants of prehistoric China, and I've learned, and hopefully you the viewer learned, much over the years. Sadly, as one would expect with so much information, misinformation and mistakes are bound to have been made over such a long period of time and seep through the cracks. You gotta remember, I'm just one guy who does this stuff in his free time, and I alone do the research, writing, editing, speaking, and uploading. And, with so many videos, and considering some of my earlier videos didn't have the same level of discipline and research and accuracy I now have, I'm bound to have made a slip up here and there. And although sometimes I get a little defensive about it when people point them out to me, I think it's about dang time that I admit and correct them. I'm as much prone to error as any guy, and I think I should confess this. And uh, I just want to thank people for pointing them out to me. This is just hopefully a short video, or at least I hope it's short, where I'll point out and correct some of the mistakes I've made in a few past videos, and hopefully I can sort of repair some of the misinformation I've unknowingly spread to viewers of my channel. Call this video Oops My Bad by Trey the Explainer. It's basically my fault for spreading this one, as far as it did. The Dimetrodon video was probably one of my first successful paleontology-based videos, and I'm proud of how the video turned out, and I'm happy to say that almost all the information in it concerning the sailbacked synapsid is still accurate. Almost. Everything was basically good until I got to talking about quote-unquote new Dimetrodon, or what I dubbed the half sail. In the video, I basically said that a 2015 study concluded that the dorsal spines of Dimetrodon were exposed and not covered in a skin-covered sail as previously thought. I spread the notion that Dimetrodon possessed a half-sail of sorts, and this inspired countless illustrations and renditions of Dimetrodon with this half-sail. Well, basically everything I said there was wrong. The half-sail thing is a complex issue, and it stems from a misinterpretation of a scientific paper that kind of got out of hand quick, and let's just say my video did not help the situation. For starters, the paper I reference isn't a 2015 paper. In actuality, it's a paper published in 2012, titled, Healed Fractures in the Neural Spines of an Associated Skeleton of Dimetrodon, Implications for Dorsal Sail Morphology and Function. The paper examined the neural spines of a specific species of Dimetrodon. The authors observed that some of the neural spines had broken and then later become rehealed. This type of thing suggests that parts of the spine were embedded in soft tissue, like a sail, that kept them in place after breaking so that the healing process could occur. However, the authors noted that the tops of the spines were often bent, sometimes severely due to injuries, which itself suggests that the tops of the spines were not embedded in a sail, unlike the lower regions. Other evidence suggesting the tips of the spines were exposed comes from their surface texture, which in the tips of the spines is smooth, while in the mid-regions the texture is consistent of that being in a sail by having impregnated with Sharpie's fibers, and the lowest regions of the spine have a rough texture characteristic of being embedded in back muscles. This evidence suggests that the tops of the spines stuck out of the sail and were exposed. So in actuality, the sail was likely not half. The tips of the spines were probably just uncovered, and that's it. This is probably a good representation of how it really should look. All the paper really suggested is that the sail didn't extend as once fully expected, but others, as well as a crappy lack of research by an immature version of myself, took this conclusion and magnified it to the extreme. It also doesn't help that the paper was behind a paywall, thus limiting the amount of people who could access it, allowing misinformation about the paper to spread unchecked. 
which is, I believe, what happened. And sometimes the authors were a bit vague, poorly worded, and highly implied things that some synapsid researchers didn't agree with. It seems like a mix of misinterpretations by readers, myself included, and a vagueness on the part of the authors that made the situation a bit of a mess. I sadly made the situation much worse through my video, and the misinformation spread like wildfire. The entire situation was a strange and bizarre mess. The paper was from 2012, and I'm not sure why it suddenly got so much attention right before my video was released. This attention was the thing that compelled me to make a video about it in the first place, as I was being told by fans and some people I collaborate with before the video was released. So I have no idea what happened. I honestly don't know where the whole half-sale thing originated from, as it pre-existed my video. I'm guessing it appeared one day on a paleontology forum, after someone read the somewhat strangely worded paper, and from there it spread. That's just my best guess, and it's a bit of a mystery. Regardless, it's just a classic case of not doing thorough research on my part, and I've since tried to fix that. I was thankfully called out for this inaccuracy by a few people, namely Roberto Diaz Sabaja and Scott Hartman. As you would expect, me from a few years ago freaked out and felt pretty ashamed of the whole thing, but didn't do anything about it till now. I still feel pretty cruddy about it to this day, and it's a very scary reminder of how much power I have and how high of a standard I need to hold my videos to. It taught me a valuable lesson, and I'm happy to finally come to admit this. So yeah, the whole half sale thing isn't really something supported by the evidence, and comes from a misinterpretation of a paper from 2012, that I believe intended to suggest that only the tips of the spines were exposed. And it really should look like this or this, not like this. This isn't exactly an entire inaccuracy, which I think is the case with much of the rest of this video. It's just something that there are a few contradicting scientific viewpoints on it, and it's a bit of a gray area as of right now. And I only acknowledged one theory on the topic which was slightly misrepresentative of the situation. Conquavenator was a rather curious theropod dinosaur that lived in early Cretaceous Spain. I've referenced it in several of my videos for its rather strange arm structures that tentatively likened by some to quill knobs, a trait seen in many feathered dinosaurs such as velociraptors as well as modern birds, which seems to suggest that they supported feathers or protofeathers or filament-like structures in life. Quill knobs and other dinosaurs are created by ligaments, which attach to the feather follicles creating a knob-like structure on the arm. The structures on Conquivenator's arms seem to resemble these. Such a possibility is significant due to the fact Conquavenator was an allosauroid theropod, a group of theropod dinosaurs that were previously unknown to be feathered. Feathers or filament structures, excluding Orniscian dinosaurs, up until then, seemed to be entirely exclusive to only Silurosaurian theropods. Evidence of feathers or filament structures outside of Silurosauria could completely change the evolutionary origin of feathers entirely, and suggest such a trait was very primitive to dinosaurs in general. Now, the position that these structures might be the anchors for a simple quill-like structure similar to those found in other dinosaurs, such as D. Long and Norniscians, is one supported by the authors of this paper, which described the animal. As said before, this conclusion could have very important impacts on the origins of feathers in dinosaurs. It might suggest protofeathers and primitive precursors to feathers were ancestral to many dinosaur groups, at least in early theropods. However, not all scientists agree with the original paper's conclusion, and some have shown skepticism towards the quill knob's conclusion. Darren Nish noted that the structures are positioned in an unusual manner for quill knobs, and found that structures resembling those found in Conquavenator are found in many animals as intramuscular lines that act as tendon attachments. This interpretation was then responded by some studies conducted by the original authors of the 2010 paper at the 2015 meeting of the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology. They basically identified a point of insertion for the major arm muscles of Conquavenator and determined that the row of bumps could not have been located between them and found the aforementioned intramuscular line explanation unlikely, again favoring the quill knobs interpretation. Although they conceded that their location would be in fact uncharacteristic of quill knobs, but not impossible using the same arrangement evident in modern birds like the moorhen. However, even then, some paleontologists still disagree with the quill knobs theory, and the area remains a controversial subject with no common consensus. So, meh? We don't know. It's a bit of a toss-up if these are quill knobs or not. So me using them as definitive evidence for feathers or filaments outside of Silorosauria is somewhat dishonest. It's as of right now inconclusive, and I shouldn't have really made any definite statements on the issue like in some of my older videos. They might be protofeathers or filaments, or they might be an intramuscular line. We just don't know. One thing to note before we leave Conquavenator is that the original specimen had excellent preservation around the tail, legs, and feet, showing scale impressions on these same areas. 
rectangular scales on the tail, and bird-like scoots and plantar pads on the feet. Just like with the conquavenator quill knobs, this technically isn't an entire inaccuracy or myth, but it's something I've said commonly and been criticized by some for repeating it or stating it as a for certain fact, when in truth the area is a bit more gray, just like with conquavenator. Feathers, as we know them in modern birds, first appeared in dinosaurs hundreds of millions of years ago and evolved from highly modified scales over a series of step-by-step -step processes, first as simple quill-like filaments, then as multiple filaments joined together at a base, and then so on and so on into the much more complex, pinaceous feathers of today. All these different feather stages are recorded in the fossil record, at least on the Silurosaurian theropod side of these. Now... It was once believed that these protofeather structures solely evolved in the branch of dinosaurs that would become birds. However, as paleontologists discovered more and more fossils, it became apparent that protofeathers went further and further back in the dinosaur family tree. Today, with it universally accepted that the common ancestors of manoraptors, copies, therizinosaurs, and tyrannosaurs were all at least covered in filament like protofeathers. Now, what is interesting and this is where I take a dip into a bit of the controversial, is that filament or protofeather-like integumentary structures have been found all throughout Dinosauria, in both Theropoda and Ornischia, and not just in this certain group. From the bristle-like tail structures on Cetacosaurus, to very similar quill-like structures in Tiana Yulong, to the fuzzy structures of Kalimdodromaeus. Some of these structures have been suggested by some scientists, namely by the structure and homology of Satakis tail bristles in 2016, to be similar enough in structure and makeup to be probably homologous or share a common ancestry with one another and to avian bird feathers, which strongly implies dinosaur skin may have been at least partly fuzzy or filament covered in its ancestral form. And this hypothesis, called by Mark Witten the ancestrally filamentous hypothesis, is something I've used in some of my videos to possibly support a common ancestry of feathers, or at least filament-like structures that are ancestral to feathers in all dinosaurs. However, this may or may not actually be true. The evolutionary origins of these filament structures is still unclear. Some scientists support a common ancestry for these structures, while others don't, with several competing explanations for this apparent widespreadness of filament-like skin coverings in dinosaurs. An alternative explanation has been put forth that these structures are not of common origin, but of independent evolution entirely. The paper I often cite finds the homology of these structures with feathers to be more likely, but notes some similarities of Cetacosaurus bristles to the cornified spine on the head of the modern horned screamer and the keratinous filament beards of modern turkeys and peafowl, which have an entirely independent evolutionary origin to feathers, which might suggest that these structures may have evolved independently from one another. The authors advise for future studies and simply state that the both explanations are on the table with independent evolution and common origin both being possible, just one more likely than the other. And this is something that is basically a microcosm of the consensus of, I think, most of the scientific community as of right now. However, the existence of pinka fibers, filament-like structures and pterosaurs, and feather proteins evident in crocodilians seems to lend credence to a common origin of filament-like structures in dinosauria, and maybe even beyond. But again, things are uncertain, and more evidence needs to be substantiated to prove either way. Before I assert the common origin of feathers or filaments in all dinosaurs, or at least in uh, a certain branch, I should have prefaced that this view is not one that is fully supported by all scientists, nor all the evidence yet, and is still a controversial area. Calendodromaeus, discovered in 2014, which is almost entirely covered in fuzz-like filamentary structures that the paper noted resembled the protofeathers of other dinosaur branches a great deal, seems to somewhat support the common origin view, although apparently a newer 2017 paper, only available in Chinese, seems to have a differing opinion that at the moment I haven't been able to read, so meh. A fuzzy theropod of ambiguous classification named Scurriumimus, possibly quill-like nipple-shaped skin structures on Triceratops, which remains as of yet unpublished, and once again Conquavenator might have some say in this. There are so many factors at play, possibly yielding different conclusions. I think some significant scientific and peer-reviewed evidence seems to support a common origin amongst these structures, but again, at the moment, we don't know for certain, and certainly more knowledge is necessary for me to say anything definitely. Dinosaurian origins are still somewhat murky right now. I think I've oversimplified the area of study a bit in some of my past videos. I also think my usage of the term feathers in some of these videos to describe filaments possibly was misleading, 
as feathers, I think carries a lot of extra baggage with it. These structures may or may not be ancestral to feathers, and I think it is best now to refer to them as filaments. These definite claims of mine existed in my channel's infancy, and sort of when I didn't really get an understanding of the full situation, and when I really didn't directly cite scientific papers and journals often, so it led me to make assertions without citing any real sources to back me up, and thankfully I've tried to grow out of this, changing my format to try to be much more scientific, and hopefully it's worked. And, to cloud the whole area of study are fanboys, on both sides, who let opinions dictate their beliefs, myself often being cited by some as a feather Nazi, and with one person even comparing me to creationist Ken Ham in my dogma to the hypothesis. My apologies if I ever came off this way, hopefully I can help change this view. It certainly doesn't help that some people are even crazy enough to claim a massive global conspiracy that all feathered dinosaur fossils are fakes just because they were discovered in China, which obviously shows their lack of knowledge on the subject due to the fact not all of them come from China and were studied by paleontologists from around the world, of different creeds, races, ethnic backgrounds, you know, you're claiming a little crazy thing here. Regardless, it's a very controversial and heavy subject among scientists, and I think my videos have oversimplified and somewhat misrepresented it. Just like with Conquavenator, it's a bit of a toss-up right now, although it seems a homologous origin of feathers or filament-like structures in dinosaurs doesn't just seem possible, but likely in accordance to the building evidence, but who knows. Either way, it seems that filament structures were at least somewhat common amongst dinosaurs, which says something very interesting towards their appearance, as they probably weren't just giant lizards like once believed but something much more diverse. The very existence of so many of these structures, homologous or not, found all throughout the dinosaur family tree really illustrates how much our view of dinosaurs is, no pun intended, evolving, and much about these great beasts from long before is yet to be known. Looking back, I kind of wish I waited a little bit before I uploaded that video, but like a bit of an idiot, I rushed it, so I could talk about the story while it was still fresh. Most of the video was accurate, but there were a few sloppy things I made and did in it that I now regret and would have done otherwise. Probably the most significant thing I said was concerning Eutyranus scales. Yeah, this was a bit of a mess. In the video, I cite Eutyranus as another example of the coexistence of scales and filaments on dinosaurs, which is something also found in Calinda Dromaeus, Antiornis, and Juavarator. As the information I found said, Eutyranus had a scaly section or two on its tail that were very similar to those found in Gorgosaurus in addition to the majority of feathers on the body. And a few people started to claim that it was a straight-up fabrication or lie by me, because, again, I'm part of some anti-scaly conspiracy. Okay, the information for me originated with a conversation I had with Matthew Martiniak, a pretty prominent paleontology author and artist who, correct me if I'm wrong, ironic, is either a paleontologist himself or has close collaboration with actual paleontologists. I don't know. Anyways, he contacted me over social media, basically rather kindly correcting an illustration I made of Eutyranus, as well as other dinosaurs. It was one of my infamous Antigument evidence silhouettes. I knew who he was, and I knew he was a pretty respected guy in the paleontology community, and took his word for it, assuming it was something in the original scientific paper that I overlooked, and decided to use the information in my video. Little did I know that the information wasn't from any peer-reviewed paper. After I found this out, I tried to track down the original source and I was able to learn that the claim originates from Thomas Holtz, a pretty famous paleontologist who is well known for his Tyrannosaur research, which he confirmed over Twitter. Long story short, it was a bit of a game of telephone, where I heard it from Matthew, he heard it from Holtz, and I'm guessing Holtz heard it directly from someone else who probably was working with you Tyrannus directly in China. And we can expect it likely to appear in a paper sometime in the future. This is still unpublished and thus not peer-reviewed information, meaning it hasn't been properly studied. In reporting unpublished info and not clarifying that it is unpublished is a big no-no in the scientific community, and I must apologize for my sloppiness. When I got this pointed out to me, I got pretty defensive and pretty pathetic. It was my bad, and I should have clarified where and how I got this information. My apologies. So yeah, when someone pointed out to me that using Twitter to get information from paleontologists to prove a point is not how science is done, uh, I looked at myself and was able to understand that they were totally right. Again, like a lot of these corrections, they're not entirely false per se, it's just a bit of carelessness on my part, and uh, it's probably not good journalism as well. Other parts of the video, I think, were also a bit sloppy, particularly some of my criticism on the bell paper, which I think was again primarily due to the video's rushed nature. 
A few of my older videos have a bunch of inaccuracies littered throughout them uh, that I don't know if I can even have the time to point out. In my Did Dinosaurs Have Feathers video, rather strangely I suggested that Longley Squama's scale structures were proto-feathers. I'm not even sure why I even suggested that, but I think it has, might have something to do with David Peters' incorrect and widely circulated claims that at the time I was not accustomed to recognizing as pure bullcrap. Longy Squama's scale structures, quite clearly, were not feathers, and were very clearly an entirely independent evolution, being highly modified in elongated scales. And, oh yeah, before we finish off this video, I just want to say some of my really older videos were especially crappy in a bit of their research, as well as my extremely arrogant and snarky tone throughout some of them. Looking back, early me was a huge jerk, and I'm rather embarrassed by the tone some of my videos had. I was still trying to figure out my image and how I wanted to act in these videos, so just chalk it up to immaturity and experience. Again, hopefully this is something I've moved past in my more recent videos. I have to say I've had this video idea for a while, but I've always been putting it off begrudgingly. I don't think really anybody likes to admit when they're wrong, and I'm not immune to that. But the best we can do is acknowledge it and fix our mistakes and move on and do our best to not make the same mistakes we made in the past. It's a learning experience, and I think I've become a much better researcher because of these kind of things. As I more thoroughly focus on making everything I say 100% accurate from now on. It's mainly the reason I take so long to make these videos. I don't want to be that guy that gives misinformation again and again. This additionally doesn't discredit everything I said in my previous videos either. I'm happy to say that most of the information in my videos is in fact accurate, and these corrections are minor compared to the bulk of my information. All I can say is live and learn, my friends, live and learn. I hope these corrections have helped and fixed my credibility. Thankfully, these errors are small compared to the bulk of the rest of the information my videos possess, and I'm happy to say I could provide some further clarification. Thanks for watching. Hope you don't hate me now.